Hello and welcome back to the channel. Well, you know, today I'd like to start off the year with a series of videos looking at some of the fundamentals we need to get a handle on to improve our astro landscape photography. And there are actually uh, two aspects to this. Firstly, for the beginners to this genre of shooting. And I guess that's those of us who haven't been doing this for long. But there is also a part of this that really does relate to the more experienced photographers out there. Well, I'm not sure if you're like me, but there are plenty of occasions where I find myself out on location and I'm in a great hurry to get going. And I find myself rushing through the preparation. I just want to get the shot. Hey, I've done this a thousand times before. It'll be right. I know what I'm doing. Well, you know what? That's exactly the attitude that may well get us into trouble. Anyway, let's get onto the tips I'd like to share with you because I think we can all learn something by going back to the basics. So tip number one, visit your intended shooting location during the daylight. And this is so important to help us get our bearings, to work out the angles for the shot and perhaps find any potential hazards on site. And most of all, work out a plan for what we'll be doing when we get back there at night time. From my experience, everything looks completely different at night. And if we've never seen the location before, it can really become a hard slog just to work out how to go about the shoot. What we'll find is that our composition choices will take much longer to work out. But even worse than that, we may miss a great composition completely because it could be hidden from the obvious view. So take the time. I know it's a pain to drive all the way out there just for a reconnaissance mission, but believe me, it is always worth the effort. I mean, who knows? Maybe you can stay on site until it gets dark enough to shoot. That's actually a really good way to, to calm down, settle our nerves, have a bite to eat, and make sure you're well prepared for the shoot. Okay, so tip number two, always check your kit bag before you leave home. Things like batteries and memory cards, this stuff's basic, but it happens so often that I just have to make mention of it. I've occasionally arrived on location with the wrong lens in the bag because I assumed it would be there. But you know, I forgot that I'd uh, changed it out to take a shot of the kids or, or maybe I was shooting wildlife in the backyard. Who knows? But I tell you what, if you don't check before you leave home, you're asking for trouble. So my advice is to have a checklist and just tick each item off. It doesn't have to be too comprehensive. Just keep to the basics. That's all we need to do. So my tip number three sort of relates to tip one, but it's about composition. Always have a plan regarding composition. This is such a common problem that I just have to mention it here. And once again, I wanna make the point that it's so much easier to work out a good composition when you can see all of the landscape elements during the daytime. So as an example, let's say we want to take a shot of a, a rising Milky Way galactic core over the top of a building. What I like to do is position myself at a location that makes the foreground look its best. And this is typically at an angle to the, the side or the front of a structure in the foreground. From there, I'll make sure that I'm facing the rough direction where the Milky Way will rise over the building. Now you can use photo pills and all sorts of uh, apps to help us guide with this. Now I have to say that this will often involve a level of compromise because we can't change that Milky Way position at all. But what we can change is the angle that we shoot from or perhaps even the lens that we choose to shoot with in the first place because that will also have a big impact on composition. Another thing that is so important is to check to see what background objects may be interrupting the clear lines of our composition. Things like tree branches or uh, power lines behind our main subject can ruin 
a great image. And believe me, when you see these things on your image on the computer, when you get back home, you'll be absolutely kicking yourself that you didn't make the necessary changes of position whilst out there on location. Now, of course, I could do and probably have done a whole video just on composition alone. So it is a big deal. In fact, in my mind, it's pretty much the biggest deal as far as I'm concerned when it comes to photography at any level. All right, anyway, let's move on to tip four, and that is to practice using your gear at night. Now, this is something that very few people talk about, and yet it's a very common source of great frustration while out on location. So let's look at it like this. While on location, our time is limited. We sometimes have to get the shot within a certain time frame, and we can't afford to have issues with our gear when that time comes around. You know, one of the most common causes of frustrations for the nightscape photographer is their tripod. And I'll include ball heads, L brackets, and camera mounting plates in that as well. There's nothing worse than having a wobbly camera when trying to shoot long exposure images. I mean, why is it that that only seems to happen to us when we do our night shooting? And who on earth keeps hiding my Allen key set on me? Oh dear, oh dear. Well, you know, in the daytime, we never have issues like that, do we? Well, you know, maybe we do, but it's so much easier uh, to fix it because we can clearly see where the problem lies. Now, other common problems are finding the right buttons on the camera in the dark. Where is that ISO button in the dark? Or, or maybe you keep hitting the, the shutter button when what you really wanna do is just preview the image you've, you've just taken. We've all done that one, I'm sure. Uh, and one of my personal dislikes, trying to see my LCD screen when the camera is in portrait orientation, low down. Now, what an absolute nightmare that can be. I thank God for fully articulating rear screens. So it's really all about becoming familiar with the gear we use. The more you use the equipment, the more we retain the muscle memory of where all the various buttons and levers and knobs are. In fact, after a while, we don't even need to look at them. We just go by feel. And that's exactly where we need to get to to become proficient at nightscape photography. Now, I haven't listed these in any particular order of importance, but this one really bugs me. And yes, I have actually learnt this the hard way. Tip number five, never ever have the mindset that says, oh, I'll fix that in post. This is another recipe for disaster. And I guess this comes under the general heading of lazy photography. I think the more we can get our images right in camera, then the less time and energy we need to spend in post-processing later on. Let's face it, nightscape photography is already very heavily reliant on post-processing, so why on earth would we want to add further to that? Many a Milky Way photographer has spent countless hours cloning away power lines or random objects on the computer because they didn't take the time while on location at night to move their position or perhaps hide these things behind some other foreground element. Yeah, I know, there are always situations where we have no choice, like airplane trails or satellites. But if we do have a choice, I say let's try to get these things right before we press the shutter button. Some of the obvious things to consider here may be basic exposure settings, aperture, shutter, speed, ISO. But beyond that, we'll run into some real problems if we don't take the time to get our focus right on the stars. Nothing we do in post is going to fix that one. We all know the old saying, measure twice, cut once. Well, that really makes a lot of sense with photography, I reckon. 
Now, while we're on the subject of editing, there's absolutely no way around my next tip. Tip number six, work hard to become proficient at editing your images. Unfortunately, with Nightscape Photography, the raw files are just not going to cut the mustard. They have to be edited and sometimes highly edited to get the best results. So we need to spend plenty of time and dare I say, perhaps spend some money learning the craft and idiosyncrasies of editing software. For some of us, that's a hard slog, but I guarantee it's always worth it in the long run. Now, many of us who may be getting on in years struggle with the computer editing side of photography, and I do completely understand that. But unless we break through the barriers, we'll always be frustrated with the results of our work. My suggestion is to establish a basic editing workflow. And as we learn the new techniques, we can simply add them onto or layer them on top of what we already do. We don't learn everything all at once. That's just not practical. But layer by layer, we can get there. But of course, it requires persistence. And persistence is fueled by motivation. So motivation is very important. We need to have enthusiasm and vision for what we'd like to achieve with our photography. And that may well be as simple as copying what others have done. There's nothing wrong with that. But my final point is going to add a little bit more to that. So tip number seven, always be willing to try new things with our photography. Now, believe me, for some of us that comes easy and for others, well, let's just say it goes against the grain. I completely understand it. It all depends on how we're wired. And that's actually the key to this whole thing. If we can work out how we're wired, we can speed up this whole learning process. You've all heard the old saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I actually say baloney to that. Anyone can learn whatever they want to learn at any age as long as they want to learn bad enough. I've seen it over and over again. So once again, we get back to the motivation side of things. So how about we ask ourselves these questions? Why am I doing this Milky Way photography thing? What is it that gets me out of bed at night to drive out to a location in the middle of nowhere to shoot the stars? And why did I spend all this money on camera gear? You see, once we get a handle on our motivation and reasons for doing what we do, then it's totally within our capability to work through all the issues that we'll inevitably face to get there. And just one more thing on this topic of trying new things. This is actually one of the best ways to develop our creativity with photography. Nothing new is ever achieved by always doing the same things, shooting the same subjects at the same settings over and over again. Now, give it a go. You may well surprise yourself in the process, but the key is always getting a handle on and standing on the foundations of why we want to do this in the first place. This becomes a tool for self-motivation, and I can tell you now, people pay thousands of dollars to get to that place. So all we need to do is sit out under the stars for a while and it'll come to you and that costs nothing at all. Okay, so I've hardly mentioned camera types or lenses or settings at all. Now, of course they're important, but they come and go. They'll pretty much all get the job done. It doesn't matter what brand you have, Oh, but what about Star Trek, as you ask? Or surely you need an Astro modified camera to do Milky Way shooting. Now, I could talk a lot about these topics because it seems this is where everybody wants to begin their nightscape journey these days. But perhaps I'll leave that for another day. So today, let me finish by saying this. Get back to the basics. Get a grip on the fundamentals of image taking. Prepare yourself 
before going out to shoot at night. Be creative and flexible in your thinking and try to see with your mind as well as your eyes. And most of all, keep the passion and love for what you do alive and kicking. These are the things that matter the most. Everything else will fall into place when we spend time and energy on those things. So as always, I appreciate you watching today. I'd love you to give me a like and perhaps a subscribe if you feel led to do so. I'll be keen to read your comments below. And in the meantime, I look forward to catching you in the next video. I'll see you then.